Mach 3, give me crew show on 2, 3, and 4. Mach 3, give me start line 2. 5 electric. Mach 3, give me start line 1 and crew show on 7 and 9. Line 1, crew show 7 and 9. Line 2, do something. I hate that place. Super off line 3, Red Bull Avionics. Super Ops. Line 7 is code 3 for light in the gear handle. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, aircraft production. Obviously, the majority of bulk of my experience is on F-16s. Eric Stromsky, the bulk of his experience on F-16s. Uh, uh, Bill Jennings, you were on C-130s, the J's, if I remember correctly, F-16s, yeah, F-35s. Correct. And next, another, on A-10s. Yeah. A-10s. Um, so I met Bill when he was a pro super. I was, I believe I was a section chief. Um, and then I have working for him as a pro super when Bill was a lead super. Me and Eric Stromsky worked together both as uh, pro supers together in the same unit. And then eventually we were both lead supers at the same time. Um, and we kind of relied on each other to, you know, get, get, what needed to be done, done. So today I want to talk about kind of um, what I see in production offices, both good and bad, and then how the production office interacts with ops. So I guess really uh, what are some of the, the low hanging fruit for what a fucked up production office looks like that you guys have seen? I'll let Stromsky go first. And I, I, got a, I got a whole so, backpack full. <laughs> you know, messed up production office. Um, I, th I think one of the, the, the backbone of your production office are going to be your expediters, right? And um, when, you, when you have expediters that, um, you know, they're supposed to be the experts at, at, their, at their career there. So um, I think an easy way in is having people in those positions that don't really belong in those positions. Um, I know my, my tenure uh, as a super and even a lead, um, I leaned real heavily on the expediters and I had some really good ones and I had some not so good ones. And uh, it was pretty prevalent in the overall atmosphere of the office and plus the AMU, right? The vibe of the AMU. When you had expediters who just weren't um, experienced enough or, you know, maybe let ego get in the way sometimes about, you know, um, making the correct decisions. But, you know, I, I say those expediters, you got to have really, really good top-notch expediters, in my opinion, to, to have a great production office. And, um, you know, and they all got to work well together, whether it's weapons or crew chiefs or anything. I mean, I know there's always that battle, but um, that's, that's from the get-go. So whether how your expediters feel about your super, but they, they all got to work hand-in-hand. -hand. And, and uh, that's one thing I've seen for sure. How often did you get to pick your expediters or get rid of your expediters? Because I know when I was – a lead super a lot of times the chief would kind of tell me who he wanted to be my expediter even though i knew that they weren't capable uh i i, I really didn't um i don't remember getting to pick i do i know i had some input when um when when chief bradford was there we talked quite extensively about the next round of expediters but um you know i was in a different situation at home we were kind of standing up we were just kind of stuck with who we had at the time and uh you know the as we went along and people came in and out, you know, I had more and more input and especially as a lead, um, you know, so I'm quite, quite often we, we, we had discussions about that, you know, um, rarely maybe with weapons, weapons wasn't a place that I really got to choose much, you know, yeah, um, right. but crew chief and avionics and, and uh, engines and stuff like that. So, but you know, more often than not, I would say. What do you think, Bill? <laughs> uh, I get it from two different angles. So uh, I'll take it from if I was a pro super, uh, one of the things that stood out to me that uh, let me know that it was dysfunctional. Uh, two examples. First one is, uh, you know, I get to have 16s at Luke. Um, it probably been a few years. Like, well, I got Luke in what, 2013. So it have been, uh, the last time I've been was 2008 um, in Korea. So I go out and I'm learning how to be a pro super on F-16s after just spending two and a half years on C-130Js, uh, which I was, I was pretty comfortable in the job. Um, but an individual, Mass Sergeant, took me out. He's a pro super, and we're looking through forms. He's teaching me the walk around. 
and there's a write-up for excessive cabin pressure fluctuation uh, on a diagonal, and he signs ER. And I said, so what does this entail? <laughs> He's like, oh, the, the ops knows about it. It's, it's, all, it's all good. I said, well, that's cool, because I'm, I'm an electrician. Um, <laughs> I've worked on eight different airframes, and that is not <laughs> something that is a, you know, partially mission-capable, uh, and it's definitely generally a non-mission capable. So I'm trying to figure out how you're signing off an ER uh, with that open. And he said, well, trust me, I'm, I'm the one that's been on these aircraft. I understand ops. You're learning, so just watch. Uh, which, uh, that's truth be told, um, and I don't tell a whole lot of people, this is what drove my first uh, visit to mental health <laughs> mm. out of my entire career. And uh, so this is 2013. I joined in 1993. It, uh, so I've been in almost 20 years. My first time in mental health was, am I going to be the, responsible for somebody dying? Yeah. So that was, that was probably my first holy crap moment uh, in production and, and it was definitely sound as something to be dysfunctional. At that same place, um, <laughs> same, uh, I was still pro super and I had walked into the office to grab a sandwich out of the fridge. Uh, the lead super said, what the hell are you doing in here? I saw a hand patting around on a desk where, where a super would normally be sitting. <laughs> And a trash can uh, full of, well, it was tipped over and across the room. Uh, so later I found out that our lead super, uh, which most people liked, uh, seeing my sir Munson, Munson, I think. Anyhow, I'm going to name, name drop because that's who I believe was in our shop at the time. Um, his thing was, you know, when he got angry, you know, he kicked a trash can across the room. He yep. thought it was funny for people to cower. Um, and uh, one of the pro supers on day shift was underneath the table trying to grab his paperwork uh, from the desk. <laughs> so if that's not dysfunctional, uh, I mean, that, that really took the, 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 the top for me because I had never been around anything like that in my entire career. So um, wow. that accompanied with their mission capable rate at the time, which was just under 60%. Yep. And uh, people work in 12, 12 hour week. shifts and yep. it didn't matter to anybody. So Yeah, I, th I think that's also a tall tale. Um, to extend the shifts for quite a long time you know if they can't if the unit can't figure out how to get done when it gets you i mean we all understand aircraft break you know old aging aircraft break and you know maintenance happens but a lot of times the the way it's scheduled the uh the improper use of downtime you know um and this goes true for even the civilian sector if you're working constantly on overtime 12-hour shifts and you know there's one or two problems it's either the how you're using your time you know, your yep. normal eight hour day, or, you know, you, you know, sometimes you just really are in that, in that pickle, but, um, and, you know, and I think, I think that's one of the biggest things that you'll see in a dysfunctional production office is when you start seeing people doing, pulling a lot of hours all the time, what typically the source of that is, is misprioritization, misprioritization of the production office, or they're afraid to say no to lower priority things. And they just want to say yes or they can't differentiate between needs and wants, and they, they think everything has to be done. Like, they're looking at DDs, code twos, they're, 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 you know, the flight teams are also asking for jets to be clean when the guys are just humping just to get them in the air. Like, it's very much a cake and eat it too type of scenario. When you have people doing prolonged shifts of, of a long time, they're gonna start to lose hope that they can leave at any reasonable hour, their productivity is going to go into the toilet. The quality is going to go into the toilet. The quantity is going to go into the toilet. And if people are still piling on all these unnecessary sort of things, then you're just going to wallow until you know people start killing well, themselves or or leaving or PCSing or you get somebody new in the office to go. That's stupid. We're not going to do that shit anymore. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely see. Um... You know, like you said, those those expediters. Uh, you know, you made a good point. Uh, make good priorities, right? Setting your people's time, uh, making sure they're using it wisely. Um, you know, people hate code twos, but knocking that stuff out early and taking care of it when you can. Um, you know, that is a huge, huge reason why a production office would be successful or not. Um, just the time management and also the priorities. You know, yep. and that comes from who's setting the priorities. Are you letting your you're letting your AMU chief set your priorities? You you letting the you know the the OIC set your priorities. Um, sometimes they don't even understand what the priorities are, right? Yep. You know, 100%. and sometimes being that guy or gal to be able to, you know, talk to the OIC and the chief versus the expediters and your maintenance folks, you got to be that middleman, right? Yep. You got to be that person that voice of reason that 
no chief, let me tell you what's really important here. Let's, let's talk about this. And um, a lot of people just, they just say yes to everything, which causes yep. those extended shifts to get, because they're trying to fit everything, get everything done, right? And if, and if yeah. your chief or your OIC is trying to tell your production office priorities, besides if there's some something that comes down from on high that this, like this would normally not be a priority and we're going to make it a priority because of the group or whatever reasons. But if you're, if you're, you know, OIC or chief is coming into your production office to tell your priorities every day, you're already fucked because that right. means they're telling the production office, you literally don't know what the fuck you're doing. And I have to now hold your hand on this. And it's really backwards because your production office should be the subject matter experts on all things related to that airframe. And if an OIC, no offense to a good OIC, if an OIC is coming into that conversation and you're, 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 you know, I see an AMU level, you're looking what? three to six, seven years of, of air, air, aircraft or air force experience talking to a combined 70 years of right. airframe experience within that production office. So they're coming in to set those 70 years straight. <laughs> so there's a trust broken there because they already don't trust that office to do what's supposed, what's supposed to be done. And they're going to come in and step on it, which means they're looking on it from, from so high that they can't even, they don't even know, which means they're going to ask to get into the weeds, which is where you start getting the minutia of checklists and reports and everything gets briefed because uh -huh. it all has to yeah. bypass your seven level expediter, super lead super. Cause the OIC now needs all the minutia and details because they don't trust <laughs> anybody below them to get it done. Right. Bill seems to agree with me. <laughs> I do. I, the biggest thing I saw, uh, you know, going from Ramstein to Luke was, when I started in production, which I started as a tech sergeant, uh, as, a, as a pro super two months prior to starting my training, the first thing they handed me was my own copy in a spiral handbook. It was a TTP, Tactics, mm -hmm. Techniques, Procedures. And they said, know this. That's what yep. they told me nonstop. So the one thing I saw when I got to Luke, obviously, uh, based on the mission capable rates and based on people working long hours, long, long shifts, was that they didn't understand the leading and lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. now, now, I mean, I tell you what, God bless Chief Roberts. Uh, God yep. rest his soul as well. He understood it. He made people yep. look into that. Yep. But not everybody knows that. And that drives a unit in the wrong direction. When you're looking at a number, just going, my, my number's low. So I got to increase. Or I got to fix more. No, let's take a step back. Yep. How, how do you do that? And, and the, the one unique thing, and, and uh, had some great leadership with, uh, with Doogie, <laughs> Hauser, um, was when we actually sat here and looked at our percentages and how we were going to get a return, allow our people to fix aircraft and get the numbers up. Uh, and this is something, again, I learned on 130s was some, sometimes you got to think outside the box. Like, how can I get the same number of sorties for ops to make sure they get their, their beans yeah. for progressing through, but we're going to do a little, little differently. And, you know, what's the impact on my folks if I do this? And, you know, and that's where we did the triple turns. But the thing was that allowed us to look at our indicators going, hey, we're not going to make it this way. What is our biggest problem? Well, we, we don't have time to fix aircraft. Yep. If, we're, if 15 of them are always on the schedule, that gives maybe 10 right. uh, that, that might be able to do something. But the crew chiefs are all working those 15 aircraft. They have to yep. have somebody else. Yep. Uh, well, so you if know, I can drop that down to 12, that gives me three additional crew yep. chiefs that could be doing work on those other aircraft. So That's huge. I'm, you know. I'm just saying that a lot of times we don't look at anything outside of what we've learned from somebody and there's there's not forums like this where people get to share those experiences to go hey i've tried this before and really yeah. worked for us um so we go with what we know or what we were trained on and so there's this huge expectation for people to deliver but again not understanding ttps to you know we talk maintenance desk bar well they created lego lego videos on youtube <laughs> the reality of it is those all exist those are yeah. truths those those happen and they're funny to watch but when you're in maintenance in any one of our shoes and you're watching it happen, it makes it not funny for a second. It's like, heartbreaking. Yeah, I've, I've been there. Absolutely heart times. heartbreaking. Uh, right. and, and again, funny to watch, but not funny to experience. Yeah. So um, I think that the knowledge and experience in production, which I, from what I know, they've kind of changed some of that requiring production schools. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that's all the way across the board. Expeditors, yes. I'm not sure with pro supers, but if they get that training and learn some of that granularity, uh, you know, different type of skills, knowledge, different way of thinking, some different avenues, I think it can make those production sections more effective if their leadership also listens to those leaders that have yeah. that experience on aircraft and then obviously the training to go behind it. What were you going to well, say, Eric? You hit a kind of a key point when you were talking about um, 
you know, one of the first questions you got to ask yourself is how is this going to affect my people, right? Yeah. Um, your human resource in the Air Force is something that's not, you know, everywhere else you work, your human resource is your number one resource. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like in the military, whether whatever branch you're in, um, it doesn't seem like that's quite the case, that the human resource is the most important. So every decision you make, you know, I mean, sometimes it's tougher than others to, to take everyone into consideration and everything, but um, the impact it's going to have on your folks, um, you know, when you're sitting in those ops meetings and they're talking about, you know, what jets they're turning and what, what configs they need to be in and how quick, you know, that should always be your first first inclination is, all right, how's this going to affect, you know, my, my weapons guys on the turn? How's this going to affect the crew chiefs? Um, you know, and then, you know, you worry about the, the, the hardware a second, but you're, if you don't take care of those people off the bat, then um, if they're not in the forefront of your mind when you're making decisions, then you're, you're already wrong. And that's just my opinion now. Uh, and that and that's certainly a symptom of I think I really feel like it's almost military specific because your personnel are legally tr entrapped within the service like you like if, if, if we treated people in the civilian sector the way we treat people in the military they fucking vote with their feet and they're gone maybe not during oh, yeah. the apocalypse because you know unemployment. But in the military, you don't have that fear that if you maltreat your people, that they're going to all of a sudden walk away because you can literally put them in a cage for them not doing the the hellacious work environment that you're that you're levying upon them. And never never mind the fact that there's almost an ingrained workaholic mantra built into the military of excellence in all you do and service before self, which is funny because they don't resource you for excellence. They 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 they, they keep <laughs> they keep cutting resources, but they have that expectation of excellence. And the service before self is basically, you know, you you are working towards a higher cause. It, it is okay for you to destroy yourself in reaching that higher cause. And that's, that's very much indoctrinated into military people in all branches from, from basic training and on. And then when you're in a, an environment where you have somebody that isn't considering the human factor when making decisions for maintenance and you have a population that can't ever say no and they're indoctrinated into killing themselves to make it happen, like that's a that's a really bad recipe. But when you get, like you said with Chief Roberts, you get one or two people in the right positions that that can look at the humanity in the unit and re refocus on that. And you know, I've certainly worked my people very very hard in my career. But it's also important to kind of recognize that you can build up credit with your people, and when you ask them to do ridiculously difficult things, that they trust you is going to be short term that it's not going to be sustained high ops tempo until they're ground into a fine pulp. They know that it's going to be for two weeks. We need to get this done. We're going to get this fixed. We're going to get healthy. Then we're going to reduce. We're going to throttle back. We'll do cutbacks. And then you, you do that. It lets your people know that, you know, this pain is temporary. It, it will be gone. They do care about me uh, and they work for you. And I think that's really rare in production. Well, you know, when, um, when you get your people to trust you and buy into what you're trying to sell, I think uh, explaining to them, I think what happens a lot is we're told just to go do, and there's no explanation of why we're doing it or the theory behind it, right? And uh, you know, we've all ran into those guys or gals that you, you can try to explain things to a hundred different ways, but they're not understanding it. So we basically just go back to the military answer and so um, if you can't understand it, I'm just telling you to do it because you fucking got to work for me and that's the way it works, yeah. right? But I mean, I, I, that was one thing I always tried to do is to, you know, especially with the expediters and, and um, you know, yep. I, I remember we used to sit there and, and have that meeting on swing shift and we'd all collaborate together, which I thought was a vital part of uh, running the office on swings was every expediter knew what the other expediter was doing. Yep. Um, we all had an idea and, and know the reason why we were doing what we were doing. And, you know, they all had their inputs too about, you know, how, how can we get this done faster or quicker? Um, you know, maybe we should try this approach or that approach. And it's a collaboration, you know, it's not so much, uh, well, this is the way I want to do it. Um, you know, um, Mark, you talked about the, um, you know, people we learned from, people we, that showed us how to be supers or how to be lead supers or expediters. And a lot of times you get stuck in that rut of what you were shown. Now, yep. some of us didn't know, right? You could have been shown a bad way to do things, but you thought that's just the way it always is. That's the way it's always done. Um, you know, but luckily I was taught by a few people that, you know, collaboration was a big part of the office. 
right? And you 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 have to have that with the expediters, and then you you kind of get their buy-in when you start trusting them and letting letting them uh, voice their opinions, letting them um, making some decisions on their own because you know they're not they're not they shouldn't be you know brand new tech sergeants or you know um, inexperience, and you should be trusting your people to do that. that you know, they take the yep. pressure and burden off you to making every single decision in the office. You're telling them what you want them to do, and you're letting them figure out the best way to do it the most efficient way. And right. a, another piece on expediters, they have they have to have a good soft skills toolkit because they need charisma. They need, they need to be able to interact with their people because they are the human face. They are the human interaction between the production office and the workforce, and you can't have – angry or robotic or i mean it's as 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 callous as it sounds i've known people that shouldn't have been you know uh uh section chiefs or supervisors or expediters because i don't know if they're raised by wolves in siberia or something but they didn't really know how to fucking interact with human beings very well like and they shouldn't be shoehorned into a fucking role that requires those soft skills. It's absolutely ridiculous that that somehow that they have to get a fair chance at promotion, develop the skills first because if you throw them in the fucking role and they don't have the ability to interact with people in a normal social fucking level, they're not going to succeed as, a, as an expert no matter how much of an expert they are on the airframe or on troubleshooting or anything else because they can't communicate and they can't interact with their people. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. You're you're managing your people. You're not yep. necessarily managing the maintenance, and that's a huge step for you know when you make you know staff uh, staff to tech and you can get that expediter seat or tech to uh, master. You're it's not about really yeah you, know, you are managing the maintenance, but not now it's about the people, right? And you got you got to levy your expectations upon them, but you also got to realize that you know not every expediter is going to react to the same. Not every person has the same skill set and. Uh, but dealing with people, that's got to be your number one. Yep. That's all it is. All night long, you're just constantly dealing. Next thing you know, airmen are spilling their guts to you about their wife cheating on them, or um, you know, airmen are acting like assholes, or you know, and that's all kinds of personalities and stuff that you have to meld together as an expediter to get them to to complete a task, right? Or how many times as an expediter do you know the, the sheet metal guy? that's really good and he comes out and he, he puts your jet party first or you have, you have those soft skills and you go down to the fuel shop and they're telling you it's going to be 12 hours. You're like, you always tell me it's 12 hours. What is it really going to fucking be? Oh, it'll be like <laughs> six hours. Like right. that's part of the, that's part of the piece that nobody, everybody focuses on, you know, e techs aircraft status and, and, you know, you know, stats and they never seem to really look at, Who's really good at this job because they, they have developed relationships within the unit. They've developed relationships with other units and they have the ability to really kind of communicate and draw in these other resources to get your jet fixed. And they're doing it literally with just fucking charisma. Like that's a right. huge piece that's totally ignored in a production office. But that's, right. you made a good point there, Chris, on, on the working with other sections. And, you know, I've been holding my tongue on it it's just <laughs> because it's in my mind right now thinking about, and again, it's, it's a part of the workers being kind of toxic in the sense, but it's driven from, uh, you know, people talking about, you know, the maintenance bag shop, you know, they're a bunch of slugs, this, that, and the other. But the reality of it is when we started doing the immersion, let people actually experience that, they had no idea the amount of work that went into that. And honestly, you, once you get that, there's a, there's a, a respect element there. You know, yeah. you have to see why sheet metal can't, you know, work for aircraft all at the same time. Yep. Uh, but again, you're thinking they have to be concerned not only with each one of their shops, what they have on their plate, every single aircraft, you know, yep. you know, we might be concentrating on one. They're concentrating all the aircraft, yep. all the stuff that's happening across the aircraft maintenance units. Um, but, but again, that, that's the key piece is, is, is mending those relationships, make sure we understand exactly what they go through. And then again, if we can communicate that and we have a good relationship, Generally speaking, uh, it, it, it pays off long term for, you know, A, you understand exactly what they got, what their impediments are. The B is you've established a relationship when something is a priority for you and it really needs to be fixed that generally they're going to bend over probably a little, little further than most days to help you out and try to get that aircraft up. Yep. Um, real. So, you know, I, I walked both those lines. I was actually, you know, the CMS super before I went to Holloman and then being on both sides of the ball. Well, you're a thousand percent right. I mean, those those backshop supers, CMS or whatever, um, yeah. they they have to worry about 
everyone's airplane. And I, I remember one specific time uh, they were trying to get shot, uh, slots for fuel shop, right? Our fuel shop, like one of the bays was down, so we were pretty limited. And I got a call from the super, and I, you know, I can't remember who it was, but he was furious that his jet, you know, didn't get the slot, a fuel shop. I'm like, well, I'm looking at tomorrow's schedule. I'm trying to balance everyone's schedule. And right now your, your jet is not as important as this guy's jet, right? Or this AMU's jet. And he, he couldn't understand it. I'm like, look, man, I'm telling you, I got, there was like four or five AMUs we're trying to deal with. And yep. everyone's got fuel shop problems. We got to schedule maintenance to get in there. So um, the, the back shop supers, that, that is a tough gig, right? And uh, sure. collaboration with the, each AMU and having a good working relationship, that's vital for um, any AMU to have to be successful. And because I'll, and you know I'll, what? Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Nope, and I'll tell you saying. what, too, like um, the, the AMU super to the back shop super to try to get a priority bumped up and you're running it, you're, you're running into a wall because literally it's what jet goes up first is really just how they're going to be ranked, right? right? What a lot of supers don't realize is call those other units, call that other super, explain to yeah. that super why your sortie tomorrow is a critical sortie because of its a currency for this pilot or see if you can, hey, can you coordinate with ops to get my pilot to fly with you then since you're gonna have more aircraft? Like there's a lot of stuff that a super can do instead of slamming his head into a CMS, EMS or, or MXS <laughs> right. super, who's literally just, he has a rack and stack for fucking priorities and he's never gonna deviate from that, especially if it's on swings. You have call the other super and go, what, what flexibility do you have? Do you have any holes? Is this a spare? Like, what can you do for me? And then it'll be reciprocated later on, as long as you're, you know, an honest type of person, you're building those relationships. But I think a lot of people don't think about, a lot of it is bargaining and haggling and trying to find a way to maximize efficiency and resources across all the units. I mean, uh, I, we were, I was pretty lucky when I was, you know, at Loop or I'm sorry, Hall, I mean, we just had the two AMUs there, right? So it was pretty easy to collaborate with the other AMU. Yeah. I can only imagine what it was like at Luke back in the heyday when you had, you know, was yeah. eight AMUs or something, yeah. right? That that back shop super must must have been going nuts, and you know, um, and each AMU too, right? Like you just don't reach out. People that aren't, you know, you're not you're not really taught to reach out to the other AMUs and ask for help and ask for, yeah. you know, um, collab to collaborate on on aircraft maintenance. But um, you know, at, at home, and I got to say that was one thing that was, you know, we were pretty lucky at, right? Each AMU really helped each other out, so. Um, was fortunate there. But I, was I was kind of fortunate, of, like you oh, with, ahead, with Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. I just so, want to say that I say I was fortunate to be at Luke when I was because all of these supers in place outside of shared resources and, and making those relationships, it was it was standard for you know somebody calling you up and trying to get in one of those positions, whether it was fuel cell, or whether it was you know a sheet mail priority, whatever it was. And so to me, that was a blessing. Uh, you know, I couldn't ask for anything more that we had all the people. I don't want to say the right, we have the right people in the right places. And granted, we didn't, not everybody was there, but the majority, we could call up and we can coordinate that. And it was usually very little effort outside of the chiefs maybe having to get engaged. So uh, again, when everybody's on the same page and you guys are marching towards the same goal and marching towards the same training, you know, whether it was working with ops to get your pilot in there or whether it was get your aircraft in someplace earlier, it, it was seriously an amazing experience having that. So what I was kind of surprised by when I became a lead super um, is, and I'm not sure how many people really realize this, this production section is still a section. So you still need to do like flight chief activities. Even though they're all techs and above, they still have childcare issues. They still have fights with their spouses. They still have failed PT tests. They still have, you know, scheduling conflicts, leave conflicts, um, you know, personality <laughs> conflicts between yeah. one shop or one shift. And I think, you know, and I'm not certainly not going to name name names any of this, but there, sometimes there seems like there's golden boys that are getting fast tracked to senior, and they dip their toe into the, the 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 section just long enough to get their section chief EPR box check, and then they get dumped right back into production. So they have like all of six months of fucking section chief experience, and then when they kind of go up the ladder to lead super, they don't have the fucking developed toolkit to run a section and to understand that they are, these are human beings and they're all going to not perform at a hundred percent, you know, all the fucking time. Um, so I was very glad that I had, you know, God, I probably had two years of section chief experience by the time I was a lead super. Um, and 
I can't imagine some of those other guys that were that were just, you know, production their whole time. And that's why a lot of times they were fucking angry and non functional because <laughs> they didn't they they just got angry because everybody wasn't fucking perfect. Well, and, you know, think about it too. When you get these the texts that come out, so they're they're expediters and they make master. You would think the natural progression would be to be a super, but you don't get any experience being a section chief as a super. As a right. lead super, you do, but as a super, you just don't. So, tech sergeants making master heading to a flight office is a really good move uh, for them, and especially yeah. if they want to be a lead super one day, because yep. you know, and, and you know, like I said. You know, your your stand in, in in flight office for six months that just doesn't cut it, right? You I mean, it just depends who you are and who your people are. Because in six months you can learn quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, especially for a crew chief guy. I mean, you, you crew chiefs, uh, you really put your section chiefs to the ringer. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you, know, that, that, you guys really, uh, really, uh, I, I don't envy uh, crew chief section chiefs at all. But uh, once they get into you know running the section and then. Um, it's a good segue, and then super, you learn the how to manage the maintenance, and by the time you're lead super, you got both both under your belt, right? People and maintenance. So um, that's a good point, Chris. So uh, when it comes to supers, something that I've noticed, and something that I've been very guilty of, and Eric's, I know Eric's guilty of, and probably Bill as well. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Making the troubleshooting call just to hurry up and get it fucking done. Whatever that troubleshooting call is, because you're kind of wow. tired of of the wallowing or the hem hawing or whatever. And, you know, doing it every once in a while just to get a jet over a hump kind of deal is, is not necessarily the end of the world. But I noticed that as Manning and experience got lower and lower, more and more often supers were the ones that were the puppet masters for all troubleshooting. And that's really kind of glossing over a real experience problem and certainly not addressing it because experience literally comes with struggling to figure stuff out. I did it. Um, and it, it's even worse when you make the call and ends up not being the right fucking uh, thing. Yeah. Like that's the worst shit <laughs> in the world. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be some people watching this video that remembers me on a Friday directing a rudder ISA can job from one jet to another <laughs> on a Friday sweet shift. Of all things. <laughs> Uh, it didn't make six. It ended up being a bad wire in the fuel cell, by the way. Um, but, like, I mean, it's great when it works out, but you're still robbing your people of experience. And then when you're wrong, that's, like, the worst fucking – because, you know, you wasted their time and they didn't learn anything. Well, and you're an you idiot. Know, that's the part of, that's the part of uh, being a, a good super is you got to let your expediters sometimes make those calls. And you got to yeah. let them, you know, run with their troubleshooting. Uh, troubleshooting ability in office can make can make or break the office period right because it, it all equates to long hours or short hours or um, and you know it's all about grooming the person below you right so as a tech sergeant or a math sergeant you, you may know how to you may know the right answer or the correct way to troubleshoot something but you have to let your expediters kind of figure that out so you know you guys you guys had much more experience on this um, you know overall uh, me being an engine backstop guy so I, I really had to trust my expediters to make sure that the troubleshooting they were telling me and the path they were going down, I did a whole lot of checking MTOs. I did the following trees myself, um, you know, but those young senior airmen and staff sergeants, man, I tell you, some of them are, you know, phenomenal in their troubleshooting abilities, especially only being in for, you know, four to six years, eight years, yep. um, you know, and recognizing that is a whole, whole part of a good production office is recognizing your, your people you can trust. Um, but as a super, you just can't sit there in armchair troubleshoot, right? You just can't dictate what goes on in the AMU uh, for all troubleshooting. And that, if you're in that position, that's a bad position to be in. You know, you may you may feel like you're doing the right thing by making all the calls and telling everyone exactly what to do, but in essence, you're not you're not grooming anyone. You're not helping yourself. No, and I think the big the, the other piece on that, um, and this is the part to be wary of on an expediter side, is when you have expediters that. You know, there are some quick things that can be done, but we don't want to spend the extra time knowing that if we take the extra steps and maybe it's got to go to fuel cell and you get, you got to pull out number one, your center cell, whatever, yep. uh, the F1, and we know that, you know, it could check bad when I reinstall, whatever the case might be. That's the one thing that was hard for me was just stopping so short going, well, we can do all these things here. This is going to yep. take long. We don't want to do it. But I grew up that, as, you yep. know, as an electrician. I wanted to make sure whatever I was going to check, regardless of the extent of it, that I did everything in my power to make sure it was good because I really hated 
you know, pitting up aircraft, put everything back together and not work. It, that dri right. drives me nuts. Um, yeah. And that, again, we had, and again, I want to say it was an ISA problem. We ended up finding that inside the conduit in a fuel cell, yep. again, we troubleshot it and troubleshot and troubleshot and I just couldn't figure it out. And I asked, have you looked at it? I'm like, what do you mean? I said, have you pulled out the wire and looked at it? This is in the conduit, have you pulled it out? Uh, and this went on for like two weeks. And finally, finally, everybody's in agreement. We're going to do this. This is the last thing. It's all can be. It's all can be. Because we checked the probes. We've done everything. And when they got in there, they found out that the shielding was corroded and everything else. And so they replaced that and it worked. But the problem was, is there was so much time going, oh, well, we're going to have to decode right. the aircraft. You're going to have to pull out right. the cell. We're going to have to, well, you know what? Yeah, Just maybe you're going to have to do that. Done with it. Yeah. And that's also something that I noticed. Uh, I don't know about in production, but certainly some AMUs, some AMU le leadership, when you know the focus is greening up a jet and the focus isn't fixing a jet, because sometimes those are two totally different things. Like I can right. green up damn near any fucking jet, but the question is, did I fix the jet so it's not going to come back? Because very much what Bill's saying, fixing the jet requires sometimes digging in and doing the really intricate, intricate complicated maintenance that's going to take time but it's never going to fucking come back again. But greening up a jet is do a JFS cocktail. If I can start it yeah. twice, it'll be on the schedule tomorrow. We'll see what happens type of deal. Well, and when units are really focused on greening up the jet. See, what's like crappy that. about that is, and I'm sure when Bear comes on, he can definitely attest to it. You know, when you send a jet up, you know, and you know, I mean, we've all kind of done it probably, but you, you know that the troubleshooting wasn't a sound or, yeah you know, quick fix, and then they lose a the sortie or the sortie's not effective. I mean, holy crap, how much time and money did you waste? So I know in the civilian sector, if you waste that much, I mean, it equates to hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm sure. Yep. You waste that much money for a company, you're not working there anymore, right? And, and so every that's time why you're breaking a trust too. Every single time absolutely. you're signaling to ops that either we are too stupid to know how to fix it, or we know it's not fixed and we're lying to you saying it is. Both of right. those are bad fucking outcomes. And that's and the it, worst thing you can do. And it's a little right. paper cut, right? Every single time it's a little paper cut when it blows a start or it comes back to lighten the gear handle or, or the vibe or the, 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 the surging in oh. the cockpit, whatever it might be. But every single time, like when it's on the bird board or before steps, they go, <laughs> oh, Keep an eye out for that one. The MFDs <laughs> blank out on you. bird board. You know. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, I took the bird board as offensive. Like, now you're trying <laughs> to run fucking maintenance. Give me your bird board. The forms are the fucking bird board. Like, I don't know what the fuck you have up there that it, sh it should be in the forms. The super should know about it. There should be nothing on a bird board that your production right. office doesn't know about and has a plan of holding the jet down or when are we going to fix it? Is it going to phase? Whatever the plan is. So the fact that ops would carry a bird board, that well, alone I speaks to something that is unhealthy. <laughs> in a lack ops, of should let, ops should let the super fill out the bird board. That's, that's what it should be, right? I, mean, I, have no problem, I have no problem with the overall view of uh, – Hey, what's the status of our jets? What, what are the bad actors? I mean, that's that's good for them to track, right? I mean, they're the ones flying that freaking jet, you know, not me, right? So, like, knowing that, hey, this one has a history of, you know, lighting the gear handle type stuff. Um, that's actually, I think, beneficial to some of the younger pilots as well. Sure. But, you know, but them arbitrarily putting up there because they had a bad feeling or they, they think it's a flickish problem and, you know, oh, this is a repeat, a repeat. But in, in reality, it's not. I mean, how many times do you have to go to debrief and change a write-up call yeah. ops after they left because their write-up was completely screwed up, right? Not the right write-up. So, um. I, had, I had a uh, DO. It was after Bear. It was when I was over in the 314th. I had a DO <laughs> that at our weekly scheduling meeting, he asked to start getting the full morning package to include all the maintenance notes. And I said, there is oh, yeah. no way you're right. getting my maintenance notes. He's like, well, I've noticed that this jet keeps no starting. I want to know what you're doing. You don't, you don't worry about what mean. I'm doing. I don't worry about how you're flying. You don't worry about how I'm right. fixing the jet. I am focused on it. Uh, lots, I'm putting lots of resources towards it. It might take us a little bit of time to get it fixed, but we will get it fixed. And there is no chance that you're going to have – you're going to crawl into my business, and I'm going to answer you about how I'm fixing jets. Not right. going to fucking happen. Well, I think we're kind of switching gears between a bad and good in production office to the off side. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, so the only other thing I really wanted to talk about that made me want to punch babies is um, <laughs> whatever supers of one AFSC 
would would stove pipe their expertise only in that AFSC. And if a jet broke, like if it was a crew chief and it broke for avionics, E&E or engines, they would go, well, I don't really know how avionics works. So they changed the deflick and I assume it's good. And it's like, okay, when you become a super, you no longer have your AFSC. You just have a particular area where you have 17 years of expertise, but now you're responsible for fucking understanding all of this. And that's why you're a super because you've been doing it so long. But you should be able to sniff out bullshit of, oh, it was rainy today, so that's why the radar didn't work. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that shit doesn't oh, work. Like, right. um, you know, and a lot of times they would turn over and go, oh, I don't know about that because I'm not avionics. Like, no, because I'm a firm believer that if someone's a subject matter expert, they can explain how their system works and why this is a good fix to anybody, any other AFSC and maintenance to a point where they can understand. And if they can't explain it or they can't answer simple questions of why, why would it be like that, then they don't know what the fuck they're doing and they probably didn't fix it. True story. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, at- once again, coming coming when I came in from experience of um, you know the situation we're in with with um, hey Bear uh, Holloman, yeah, yeah, he's still connecting audio. Hey Bear, hey guys, what's happening? We were just talking about <laughs> ops and Stromsky's like we should slow down until Bear gets here, so that's perfect. Yeah, just wait. You just wait. <laughs> <laughs> So I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> oh, so the super, right. The super not knowing. I mean, you, like I said, when it comes to trusting your ex players, I mean, sometimes you're not going to be, you know, you work in the flight line for, you know, crew chiefs for almost your whole life. You're working on the flight line. Uh, yeah. Backstop guys, you know, you can get stuck in the backstop for years um, and then some file, make your way on the flight line later or younger. Um, but eventually, yeah, you should, you should be able to explain. I mean, it's not like anything really new happens in maintenance to me. You start seeing the same old thing over and over again, and yeah, there's some weird fixes, but um, you know, it, it's getting involved um, also with the back shops and like, hey, field shop, what did you guys find? How did you find it? Um, hey, you know, um, avionics back shop, you know, what did you guys do? And to me, a good super is reaching out to those places to find out what happened, not just like, oh, did you fix my airplane? Cool, yeah. thanks, right? Um, yeah. and, and getting involved, and you know, when you come in with less experience, it's even it's more important that you. Like I said, listen to your ex-players, trust them, trust the other supers, and get involved. And it's not just, oh, I greened up a jet, I'm done with that one. Yep. But understanding the whole problem. And you know what? Those tech wars, you, you start getting into those, and, and you can find out a lot, a lot of information in there. It's just, you just have to get in there and read it, right? And then having the, the capability to understand what you're reading and uh, put it all together. And, yeah, that's, that's what a good super should be doing, you know? Yeah, kind of segue on that, like – I, I did a lot of impounds. I was I was an impound official a lot. I was oh, ne- really? I was never on a crew chief impound <laughs> my forever. entire career. I was always avionics and E&E on impounds. And that sometimes meant reading the theory of operation three or four times. Because some of those avionics theory of operations, that's just hard to really fucking understand. So you'd read through it and go, okay, I got maybe half of that. And then read back through it. And then I would reach out to Doogie. I would reach out to Bruce. I would reach out to Falcon Hotline and go, can you explain this to me? Because I don't understand it. And so that way, when I go to the meeting, I am now the expert on, yeah, it might just be nose wheel steering. I may not know everything, but I certainly know everything about nose wheel steering. And I can explain exactly how the fuck this works, why it's not working, and the direction I'm going to be going in. And as soon as you do that, Everyone that was that was looking to micromanage you just fucking gives up because they're like, he's got it, he's got it, right. I'm just let it go. Um, and it, it would drive me nuts when a crew chief, you know, I know I'm shifting a little bit to impounds, but impounds like a micro production office would just go. My guy said this will fix it, and they couldn't articulate why. Well, now there's going to be no trust. You're not fucking doing your job, and it was the same thing with supers. Wow. Their notes, you know. Yeah, I've seen uh, impounds up, up at Loop when I was in QA. We used to have to sign off the impounds with them. And, uh, you know, Colonel, Colonel Mora, um, gosh, who was, a, who was a tall guy that was there before him? Parkhurst. Um, yeah, Parkhurst. Yep. Holy crap, they would really grill the yep. impounders. As they there. should. And, right. you know, they would, they would ask them off-the-wall questions. And, like, part of it was for their understanding of the impound. But, um, secondly, I'm sure it was to make sure the solid maintenance was done. And it just wasn't a pencil whip type impound, uh, impound clear. Um, and those supers I didn't, or whoever that impound official was, you know, some, they, some were deer in the headlights. They had no idea. Yep. Right. Um, you know, so I, we've all seen those impound officials kind of rush in 
and you know, hey, let, tell me what you did, what's going on, and be so far detached from the impound, it, you know, that's that's criminal in itself almost. But um, anyway, like I said, I think we're getting off off subject yeah. here. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bear, welcome to the chat. You know Eric from uh, Stromsky from Holloman, I'm sure. Uh, this is my friend Bill Jennings. He was a lead super with me at Luke. Did you know Bill Jennings at Luke? I know, I know I've seen you around, Bill. I think, when did you, when were you at Luke? I was there 2013 through 16. Okay, so 308 for my first, well, 308 for my first year, and then the combo 308 through a ninth for my second year, and then uh, 61st F35 is my third year. Okay, so I left, I was there at Luke from 2010 to 2014. So okay. we, we did overlap there a bit. Absolutely. Where were, you, where were you at? Were you in the 309th? No, I was the 310th. Okay. It's very possible that I saw you out there. I worked a lot with Chris, and then after David the Bruce went over that way uh, with him as well. Yes, David the Bruce. And Craig Bagard. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Booger. Yeah. So um, we kind of talked – we just got done kind of talking about what a healthy production office looks like looks like and kind of what symptoms of an unhealthy production office looks like. And a lot of it had to do with trust, which I think really speaks to the ops piece as well because the production office and the AMU and how it interacts with ops, there has to be trust between the, the maintenance unit and, and the ops side, both that the maintainers trust that the pilots are, you know, doing what they need to do and only what they need to do. Um, and the ops is trusting that the maintainers are getting good fixes and it, it's all kind of working. Um, I guess really what I kind of want to ask you first is, especially as your career progressed, how did it feel knowing that everything that you did as a pilot was creating the work for the maintainer? And that's not like a shot, but I'm saying oh, is like, yeah. you know, like that's got to be a tough pill to swallow that every single time you have something, you're creating work for these guys. When you see them kind of getting beat down, it's got to be hard to kind of reluctantly or, you know, just kind of giving them piling the work on. Yeah, that's a really good point. And especially as a, um, it's, and you're right, it's different as your career progresses. You know, as a young dude, you're just kind of like, man, I'm going out there, I'm doing my thing. And, you, I mean, we're pretty self-centered as young adults anyway. Yep. And as a young lieutenant, like, my whole job was like, man, I'm just going to go fly this airplane. I, I can barely keep my head above water to, to brief, you know, fly, debrief. And I, I'm just barely making it. I didn't have a spare brain cell for yep. what, what <laughs> else was going on. And I was like <laughs> – and I'd just be like, dude, I'm, I'm doing my best here, man. Like, you know, what, what, what do you need from me? And, uh, and it didn't, as I started to catch up with the airplane, was that's when, like, you know, so as a captain and especially uh, as a major, that's when I really was like, oh, okay, this is, we're a team here. And, you know, when I ride up a jet for, you know, something silly or, uh, I don't know. It, it depends on the philosophy of the DO at the time too, right? Like, are, Hey, are we writing up everything or are we trying to help these guys out? Like, you know, boss, what do you want us to do here? And then, and you, and you're right. Like it, it wasn't until I was, uh, I guess a flight commander at Spangdalem when I'm like, Oh man, I know what it was. I was top three, uh, in Balad and kind of trying to manage the schedule while trying to, you know, interact with the supers a lot more. I was like, holy cow. Like, okay, I'm starting to get this a little bit. Like, this is, this is a lot going on here. Like, yeah. you know, and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to put, you know, 16 jets up 24 hour ops. And I was like, okay, this is a thing. And I need to figure out what, what really matters. What is the, what is the FMC jet? What does that really mean? And you know, you, I think your perspective changes when it's, um, yeah, these guys just, you know, worked all weekend because we broke a bunch of jets on Friday. Yep. Oh, man, that sucks. Or, <laughs> or why, you know, I get all bent out of shape. Like, why don't I have my 12 front? You know, it impacts my training. Why don't I have my 12 front? And you, and you look – it's, you don't just look last week, look last month and the month yep. before that and the month before that. And it's, it's all carrying time. over. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So that's an interesting question too. Um, you know, you kind of said, what do I need in my experience? And I don't know if it's because sometimes there's an adversarial relationship between the AMU and ops where the yes. AMU is trying to say no to everything and ops yes. is trying to ask for everything. So that way it'll end in a fair middle ground kind of, or it'll, it'll yeah. create bargaining chips on each side. Well, okay, I'll trade you this for this type of deal. Um, but from my experience, my limited experience in production, it seemed like a lot of pilots slash ops units have a hard time differentiating between what is a want and a need, what's a luxury and what's a mandatory sort of mission or sortie. And it may be because they don't perceive the, the, the logistical cost from the AMU to get those wants. Or if it's just because the adversarial relationship of let's just ask for everything and see what the AMU shoots down. Do you think yeah, that? Ops kind of, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what I what I had found out a lot of times from the maintenance perspective is that we didn't know the planning that went into to ops uh, requesting right. the airspace. You know what that airspace is specifically for. Um, again, I got that after my first year on 16s, and that that played a huge piece. Like, okay, we. We did that three weeks out, so that, that was reserved for X, you know, and this is what we have to do when we have that airspace, you know. I'm like, okay. So then we got to figure out what we got to do, but the biggest piece is also understanding what's on their part, and, and a lot of times we don't. Uh, we don't understand the airspace. We don't understand the times uh, that they all agreed upon. Um, that happens well outside of us, and all we're thinking about is, okay, they, they need X amount of aircraft, and, you know, we're going to try to provide them in these, in these configs, and hopefully we can make, make their numbers. Um, but that, to me, was a one of the successes, again, from the through 8th AMU, um, even working with Major Artige, uh, and I cannot remember the deal at the time since I had several. But like I said, there was a very open line of communication that, again, I kept on asking. <laughs> we have these impediments, like how, what, what do you guys have to do to get there? And, yep. you know, what, what can we bargain with? You know, there was some bargaining. So um, I do remember uh, Bear, um, when we were at Holland, man, I remember uh, you, you set up a briefing for the production office. You set yes. up for the, um, boy, let me tell you what, that briefing, uh, explaining the airspace, explaining even down to your training and what, you know, how your training like the VR, like 6.3 is equated to like what, what boxes a pilot had to check yeah. at what stages, what happens if they bust their, you know, bust their yeah, flight. I, I still remember that there were man, gates that was, in your syllabus that if the pilot didn't get through those gates, they couldn't advance. So it's like, that's why we have to throw another four ship up in this yeah. config that we thought we were getting out of because this guy blew a ride type of deal. Right. That was a big, that was a big eye-opening thing as a yeah. super to understand yeah. the ops. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, so, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't go mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Go there. Yeah, so, like, that was something that when, I mean, Holloman was a real, for me anyway, it was a real special thing because, like, you know, when Fester and I got there, we're like, all right, we're going to build a fighter squadron and a relationship with the AMU the way that we wanted it when we were lieutenants, captains, like we're, we're going to do this thing the right way, the way that it should be. And I remember, you know, in the very first meeting I ever had with, uh, I think it was Craig, Wright. Yeah. And I was probably. like, yep. Craig, yep. I was like, <laughs> dude, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you what I'm, what I need. I'm not going to do the standard ops, I'm going to ask for the moon because I, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, ask for a 16 front, but I only need a 12 front. Like right, I'm not right. going to do that. I'm going to tell you what I need. And then you owe me the honesty on the backside of that to say, I can, or I can't do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, right. and, I, and I was like, okay, like this is going to require some significant trust and a change in the, that adversarial relationship. It's a collaborative. The, Absolutely. Yeah. And Spain was a lot more of you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because you, when you lay your nuts on the table like that, you're like, all right, well, these guys can totally, they can tell me what they want. And, and I'm going to, I told them I would believe them. I told them that they told me they couldn't do it, that I was going to accept their word. And I can't tell you how many times I, you know, went back when investors like, you know, that's bullshit. They, they can, they can't do that or they can do that. I'm like, Hey, listen, boss, I told them, I, I gave them my word that if they told me something, but anyway, <laughs> Like, but you're right. Like, uh, you know, the, the B core syllabus is a really good example. It is so prescribed and event driven. And I'm trying to think what month it was. I, I, I think we wrote something insane, like 
200 and something 2407s one uh <laughs> good night. Good night. It was one book. Yeah. I remember you that. Remember that Eric? You were there. Yeah, it was. It was a lot. It was and every it was because, day. It was because we kept we kept overging jets. Yep. My students were overging airplanes, and and so they would bust their sortie, and I would have to reconfig the entire go. Right. And so we wrote a twenty in one month. We wrote a, we wrote a twenty four oh seven at least one a day. Oh, that would easy. that would crush the entire go. Yep. Right. And so, oh, it was awful. And yeah. I remember. So uh, one of the dudes that just showed up uh, here in Fort Worth, he's like, "Hey, do you remember that time? Then you walked into, I, I called all the students into the mass briefing room, and I, man, I've never been so angry in my life. I was like, <laughs> the next dude that over G's one of my airplanes." You're, you're done. You're fucking done. I, can't, I cannot, you cannot do this anymore. We are, we have crushed. Did you throw Maybe a garbage can? Yeah. And he goes, he goes, to this day, I still remember that conversation. I was, and I was like, well, I guess left an impression. And that's, that's right. You know? <laughs> but, so, uh, um, so in my time, it seemed like there was a, the only way I can describe it is the more resource poor the Air Force got, the more they kind of tightened up and, and, and weren't really willing to invest in the time it took to grow the force and experience. Like, that shit just takes time. Like, I'm very good at troubleshooting the JFS start system. The reason I'm very good at troubleshooting the JFS start system is because in 2004, for 10 months, I worked 12 hours a fucking day, every single day, getting my ass thoroughly kicked by no starts. And that's how I developed that. Like experience doesn't come with easy times and easy maintenance. It takes people suffering and the, the tree is exhausted and they have to go to schematics and they have to go to theory of operation to figure it out. But it seems like as the ops tempo stayed up and the experience level went down, we kept deferring that experience debt forward and forward and forward and forward. Mm -hmm with having more and more people step in and cut troubleshooting short to get the quick fix, to get the jet for ops and so on and so forth. And what seems to me now is, you know, and I read an article recently about some Navy guys in the Pacific that, you know, there was that horrible mishap where the F-18 crashed into the C-130 because they were doing night refueling and they hadn't done it. Their, their, their currency was really low, but, you know, I think the air force is running into this, into this, you know, inevitable crunch where the maintenance side is not healthy in right now morale experience and manpower the ops side at least for the fighter side has a massive fighter pilot vacuum that that we literally can't generate enough fighter pilots where we are and it seems to me because you know obviously my sphere of, of knowledge is really focused on the atc training piece but it also seems like there's some currency of operational pilots where the the iron can't really support the competency but now we're at a point where pilots have to fly like they have to fucking fly because of currency of current pilots plus generating new pilots to replace the ones that are retiring out but there's no experience maintainer, uh, no experience maintainers, but there's a lack of experience maintainers and we can't afford them the time to gain experience. Like, like there's going to be, to me, it seems like there's going to be a collapse of the system unless something really drastic happens is how I'm looking at it. Am I off base between the people in this discussion? There's two different things on that, Chris. One's called technical debt. And uh, again, I no longer work in aviation since my retirement, but, everything kind of relates and technical debt is sitting there letting what we know is part of the problem, uh, which means advancing our, our, our folks proficiencies, knowledge and experience. We're, we're not getting there. We're holding back on that. Yep. So at some point in time, like it's, the ship's going to rock or, you know, we're going to hit that wall, but we call it technical debt in, in the software world where they keep on investing into old, uh, old technology and whatnot. And they just keep on, piling stuff on that, but it's going to make the problem even worse yep. after the fact. I mean, it's proven. Right. So that, that's one part of the problem. For aircraft maintenance, I can tell you uh, it wasn't received well, but in between manpower and documentation, uh, it doesn't matter if it was G81, it doesn't matter if CAMS, GUI, IMDS, pick whatever term you want. 
um, because they got away from managing that the way it was supposed to, pee time, you know, I got a person that's uh, on leave, this, that, and the other, um, you know, troubleshooting time. We had the issue, we started losing major uh, E&E and avionics my first year there at Luke. Um, and the same thing I did when I was at Ramstein. I said, well, you know, I asked uh, Danny, works up for analysis, I asked him to run me a five-year report on how many times we actually took a troubleshooting action. And for five years, uh, there's only two entries in there. And this was right. for avionics and E&E, since right. they were the ones that were dropping. So again, when you take that piece there, and I have a person, and, and I, I saw this when I was in IG, uh, part of my departure, these guys averaged, they were documenting realistically two and a half hours of work per week. Mm -hmm. So when you do that piece from a manpower standpoint, um, LCOM itself, and we say we don't really, it's not really used for that. Well, it is. Uh, it, it is used for that. It's still used for that. Even though they come in and they do a manpower study, the problem is we're not documenting the utilization of the people and the work that they do throughout a day for the duration we're not doing it accurately. So the reflection is, I don't need that many people. I, I cry, I can whine, I can, you know, send up a report. But the reality of it is, every single base I did an inspection on maintenance, that was the one thing I did at every single one, is wrote a utilization report. The highest number that I had was somewhere around 12 and a half hours per week because they weren't documented correctly. So when they have a reduction in manpower, again, it was directly related to a five-year study on each one of those on how their numbers slowly decreased whether it was experience, new people in there, uh, limited focus, you name it. But there's a direct correlation with the manpower reduction and the inability to uh, get out of this technical debt piece because I'm not going to have the manpower to do it. I don't have the experience to work the aircraft, fix the aircraft while I'm training people in the background. No, experience is a huge thing, man. So like, like Chris mentioned, we're trying to, you know, make all of these fighter pilots and – so we say, all right, well, we need to make them faster. Well, we don't have any more airplanes. We don't have any more maintainers. So the only way to do this with the resources that we have is we have to cut the amount of sorties that we're going to put them through training. And so now I've got less experienced dudes going to the CAF. Less experienced dudes are instructing the fighter pilots that are in the CAF. And so I'm going to get less experienced instructors back at Luke or Holloman to be instructors. And so this thing, we are on a, I don't know, we're probably about what year seven or eight of this cycle. Yeah. And so now I've got dudes yeah. that are getting ready to be majors DOs potentially that are less experienced by a significant margin, you know, 20% as a guess from what wow. I was. And, and so like, we can't cover up our mistakes anymore. Yeah. Like we used to be able to with like I could get myself out of trouble because I've, I've got a lot of experience. I've flown a jet for a long time. So yep. I get myself out of trouble. These guys can't. Yep. And we're seeing it and we're, I think what's happening. And I think that a, it's going to take some balls. It's going to take a safety report that yep. says, dude, this is not a isolated incident. This was directly caused by our lack of training, our lack of material, our lack of, jets are lack of maintenance experience and they have to go all the way back a systemic problem like when that jet dumped at uh, at holloman um it was around thanksgiving time right like right yep yep i remember that that accident was because of our training i, I gotta mm. say it man like yeah the dude the student screwed up he did the wrong procedure but it was because he was failed in his training getting to that point yeah Right. And, and I, dude, I screamed, I stood on Slab Jensen's desk and I said, sir, this is the answer. And the SIB is going to miss it. We need to, we need to say it. That's scary. Right. And we never well, said you, it. When you're, when you're balancing, you know, when you change your expectations based off your, your manning, both for pilots uh, and maintainers, um, irons getting old, maintainers getting fewer, uh, pilots are having to be, you know, rush through, rush through training. Um, you know, at that point, as Air Force as a whole has to look at the whole picture and, and decide what are we going to do to either change the expectations or make sure everything we do is a hundred percent value added to training these pilots. Yep. Right. Um, every, every jet, every config we fly, every, every bomb, every bullet we load in that jet, you know, are we getting the most out of that for that day? Um, and I think, you know, at times when both sides realize, Hey, ops understands that maintenance is hurting and, Maintenance understands that ops is hurting as well, right? Yep. 
I mean, I always see all the pilots come out and, um, you know, I, I know recently, uh, probably in the last year of my enlistment, maybe two years, um, there was a significant drop in pilots because they were all going privatized, right? They're all going airlines possibly, or maybe going guard. We were talking to a couple of the pilots in the three three eleventh that were just, you know, they were done. They were done with all the yep. um, expectations that were levied upon them. And, and you're right. It, it's starting to get, you know, really dangerous between rushing these pods through um, getting forced to put this old iron in the air that, you know, it's what we have is what we have to deal with. Right. Um, so I, you know, both sides understanding where each other is coming from. Uh, it's a huge benefit for an AMU and offside. Um, unfortunately, it's not like that everywhere. I, I mean, I can only imagine that, and what's, you know, what's that really collaboration fr- doesn't happen. What's really frustrating about it is ops has this impossible goal which is if it's active or if it's you know a calf unit it's basically currency and and now they are they are shouldered with the training debt that AETC couldn't meet because they get pilots showing up and they're going to have to do a bunch right. of local sorties hang out with an IP to develop those skills that should have been developed during B course slash the track training by a- AETC um, but it, obviously in AETC there's just a, a tremendous hunger for for pilots and getting pilots through so really it's universal in the air force of just getting those those pilots needs met but then the AMU side is they are jealously guarding every single resource they have because they know that it's you know on the cusp of of a maintenance collapse or a death spiral so now what you have is you have these external influences from the air force of mismanaging the entire force through manpower experience, iron, you know, you name it, it's been poorly fucking run, but it's what it is, is it's, it's the focal point now is it's straining the ops and the AMU relationship because each side has to try to save their piece of the puzzle because they know that's going to help ops in the long run and the AMU in the long run. But I just, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm not, you know, smart enough to see the way out of this, but I don't see a way out of this. I don't know how this can, how this can. Okay. I think one of the, the only thing I could ever think about was, um, you know, okay, so like as a commander, like, hey, uh, my job, train, equip, you know, that, that, that my people. And so my last job on active duty was uh, the classic or active associate here in Fort Worth. And so I had 155 enlisted maintainers in my squadron, which was, dude, it's awesome. Like, unbelievably <laughs> incredible experience. Like, I, I gained a, a ton of respect for what you guys have to deal with, with 18-year-old knuckleheads all the way up to uh, <laughs> cocaine-snorting tech sergeants. I mean, it was a <laughs> full gambit of stuff, you know. And uh, people scream for... I need more people. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot do it with what I have. I need people. I need the dollars to train them. And I don't know, you know, a 1985 F-16, you know, maybe the 21 or 24 PAA structure just doesn't work, right? Yep. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it doesn't, it, it, it takes more time for, with that airplane. Yes. So and if I you need, if you and if you have more iron to meet those needs, you got to have the people to maintain the iron. Well, right, that was our biggest battle, right, Chris? Oh, we'll just throw more jets at it. We'll just we'll just oh, borrow yeah. jets from another AMU. I mean, that's something we did continuously in order yeah. to meet the um, the um, two minutes meet the um, <laughs> sorry. Eric's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I got ten minutes. <laughs> uh, Meeting the the rigorous schedule of uh, you know getting these pods through and flying these these crazy sorties and you know amount of sorties you know flying a year and it, every year it's more and more sorties, but somehow I don't really understand that how we're flying more sorties with less pilots, right? I just didn't really get that. But it maybe equates to what Bear was talking about the skill level of the pilots, right? I mean, how many extra rides are we putting these pods yeah. through when they bust their ride and they have to do it over again? And yep. you know. It took a lot. I mean, a lot of people don't know one 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 pilot can eat up four airplanes, right? Six airplanes, whatever the the ship needs to be, just for that one one training mission. Yep. So, um, you know, both sides being heavily heavily damaged with manning, right? Um, you know, uh, it was alluded to earlier about the LCOM, right, and, and everything in there, right? Documentation was huge. Uh, we lost a lot of people because maintenance wasn't being documented. So they're like, oh, you only have X amount of maintenance to fly this many sorties. You know, yeah. we, we, we don't need to provide you with more manning. Show, show me on the paper where it says you need more manning. And on top of that, when corner cutting becomes how your unit functions, 
when, you know, I, there was times where I was a section chief where we had five people on swing shift and I'd see a light in the gear handle, an engine removal, engine bay install, multiple tow jobs. I would be like, um, all of those fucking tasks require like five people to do, which means they <laughs> couldn't have done them at the same time, which right. means there's no fucking way they did all these things by the book, you know, safely and quality maintenance. They had to cut corners to get this done. And I'm looking around the room and everyone in here has more fucking stripes than me and they should know more than me. And they're all like, totally guys, good job last night. Okay. Are you not <laughs> catching the fucking piece where – are you so removed from aircraft maintenance where you don't get that these guys all violated tech data in order to get these jets up? And at some point, it's going to fucking bite them in the ass. And by the way, no one in this room is going to fucking fall on their sword for those guys that you promoted an environment of corner cutting because you rewarded that type of behavior. Instead, you're going to you're going to give them an Article 15 for a TO violation or whatever. Or a, for, for God, you know, heaven forbid, a, a jet goes down because corner cutting became part of the, the culture. And I'll tell you what, like impounds – or even just when I was being a stickler for, for following the TO, you could tell that corner cutting was so – had permeated the culture so much because everyone would ask, why is it taking so long? Okay, it's supposed to fucking take this long. This is how long it's always supposed to take. But we've been, you know, doing it the quick way for the last 10 or 15 years. So that's now what everybody kind of expects shit to do. And then, like – I mean, it's really you're just wringing the last little bit of fucking juice out of the force to get the sorties done and at, at the expense. Like, like you can you can you can chase efficiencies in pilot production. You can chase efficiencies in getting jets fixed. You can chase efficiencies in removing unnecessary tasks from the TO with a wink and a nod. But at some point. Those individual things are all safeguards to prevent a mishap. And yeah, it might feel like a luxury when your force is super healthy that you can have all these these layered safeguards to prevent a mishap. But the reality is, as you start r removing those and creating a culture where it's expected that those things aren't there, shit, people are going to fucking die. Like that's really just the way I can well, see it. You did you say, said, Chris, one time that failure, right? Failure has to be an option sometimes. And that's, you know, that's, I think that's on both sides for ops and, and maintenance. Sometimes we're going to fail, right? And it, it, it happened to us at home and happened to Luke. I mean, failures, you know, if you, if you don't accept failure, well, then you're wrong off the bat. So, yeah. you know, um, not every story is going to be effective. Not, not all maintenance is going to make it. Um, especially like we talked about with the dwindling force and dwindling, um, you know, funds and uh, dwindling experience, you know, it all ties into sometimes we, we, we just won't be able to make it. And uh, both sides collaborating and understanding that sometimes that, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll make do with what we got and we'll, we'll make it the most right out of every, everything we get. Well, I think, I think there's you, really important no, you there is when you say, when, you know, the AMU comes to me and they say, dude, can't make it. We are not going to make it. And then I have to go, and, and it's important, like, to have that ability to go to the man and say, hey, sir, we, we collectively, we're not going to make it. We're not going to do that thing. We, can't, we cannot do it. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a little, like, nobody wants to say no. Like, we're just right. not built that way. Or else we wouldn't be, you know, uh, senior NCOs or, uh, you know, I guess – I don't know. Last time I heard, I, you know, I heard an officer say no. He was a, he was a lieutenant. He got his ass kicked, you know. So it's like, all right, well, I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to work either. I'm going to outwork the problem, which at, it just becomes impossible at some point. So anyway, to go to the man and say, sir, we can't do it. It's impossible. Right, and, and that has to be okay, right? You, you're That's you're right. Exactly. the man has to say whoever the man is, you know, chief, uh, colonel, whoever it is. It, it's got to be okay now as that chief or colonel whoever has to answer that question um tell me what we're going to do to fix it how how what can we yes. do to make it yes. happen right and then everything yeah. we're doing you know maintenance wise uh ops wise is it is it going to be the most effective for that day for that time right are we going to make the most out of the situation we're in and uh you know smart maintenance um you know that's where your good lead supers come in long-term planning um smart planning with your do's to understand like would you guys need not just today, not just this week? Would you need next month, right? Let's start setting up for that. Um, if that doesn't happen, then it just it becomes a total nightmare, right? And you're and you're like you said, we said at the beginning of this conversation, we're stuck out there for 12, 15 hours a day, right? Just trying to 
oh, failure's not an option. We're, we're going to yep. get this done. We're going to fly this tomorrow. And at what cost sometimes, though, right? Bill? Can I bring up another angle on this? Yep. <clears throat> so over the, well, since 2016, when they uh, modified the Commander's Inspection Program, um, one of the big things with that, or the Air Force Inspection System, rather, um, was giving the wing commander, commander the authority to accept risk. All right, so if he's supposed to accept risk, what is the communication link down to the group commanders, to the squadron commanders, as far as, you know, if I tell you that I'm in a risky situation with the amount of aircraft or the amount of maintainers, my experience, is that being up channel properly? Is it being accepted? Is that being put out on the monthly or quarterly commander's inspection reports that go up to their command? I don't know. I can tell you from all the ones that I've read, which are hundreds, over my time in IG, uh, they weren't. So I would go up to, I would read those always first to see, okay, I'm gonna look at the last two years. I'm gonna go do an inspection. I always sat down with wing commander and I'm like, everything's great, right? And then I go talk to group commanders, squadron commanders. It's not great. They're, right. they're, they're, they're falling on their butts. And, and I'm trying to figure out, well, okay, what's the communication? Like, well, this is what we forwarded up for our commander's inspection management board. Uh, however, it's, it didn't fall in the top three, so it's not a big deal. So that top three didn't get up channel to command. Yeah. But that was where the you know the command IG was was actually doing doing some favors at least inside air combat command was we would put that in the report and we sit down with the four star and tell them this is this is what we actually saw and then we give them all the documents the supporting documentation um but that's the one piece is you know are, how are the wing commanders engaged in this what is, are they vocal about this like give me the feedback let me know how everything's happening out there are they accepting that piece or do we have people in a intermediary position that don't sure want to do. let the boss down. I, sure I don't do, want to let the boss down. I want the, the negative light, and I'll do whatever it is so that I can just paint a great picture. And it reminds me of when uh, when uh, SecDef Mattis came out with that 80% fighter readiness mandate for, what was it, F-18s, F-15s, F-16s, I think maybe F-35, F-22, I can't remember, but it was something like that. And, you know, I had been retired for six or seven months, and, you know, the last year of my career I wasn't really – you know, I was the PEM, so <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but, like, I knew that there's no way the force had recovered to a point to make that 80%. Like, I think reaching an 80% MC rate, man, uh, you know, target is a fucking great idea. Absolutely, we should be at 80%. But when he gave a by the end of fiscal year as a deadline, it yeah. told me that he was so divorced from the reality in the field, which goes to what you're talking about, Bill. Like at some point, the signal of we're fucked got interrupted as it got up to sec def. And there was a bunch of yes men but, somewhere between when that signal broke. They was telling them, yeah, fuck, we could totally do that. We but, should look, <laughs> look, you don't get promoted. Uh, not, right. You know, I, you know, you don't it probably holds true through all ranks mostly, but you don't get promoted by telling people that you're going to fail. Right. And, <laughs> That's what it, what it equates to, right? You, you report everything up and, hey, everything's roses and sunshine and freaking rainbows, right? But you tell that, and what happens is you, somehow the maintainers, ops, they just make the shit happen. But then it just keeps continuing. We keep making it happen. But no one asks at what cost and what, what's, right. co you know, eventually you can't sustain that. And then yep. when all your shit is broken and everybody is freaking out because stories aren't happening and, and jets are broken, I mean, what do they expect? But they still report up like, oh yeah, we're good to go. You know, we got a plan for this and we got a plan for that. But I mean, in reality, sometimes there, there's just no planning. You have to, you have to stop, right? I mean, I've never seen any, even when we had deaths or suicides or accidents, it didn't stop, right? No, it just kept going, right? And it, it's never enough. And that, that's a huge problem in my eyes. It's, it's just never enough, never enough sorties, never enough fixed aircraft. MC rates, not high enough, I mean, um, and then we're going to, like I said, it continues to dwindle, right? I mean, manning, funding, everything. So, Look, it's because you don't look lateral to each one of those pilots has a family or and or a wife, uh, friends, a community. And that's the piece that really, to me, at the end of the day, you know, even talking with the supers on 35s and 16s and 130s when I was filling in, the biggest piece I told them is when you're signing that exceptional lease, all that maintenance that was done, don't do it just because you read the pages and the pages look good. If there's any part of you that even yep. questions a piece of that, yep. think about the pilot before you sign that line every single time. Right. Because at the end of the day, that's what you affected. Every person that's attached to that one pilot, 
And if it's on a 130, it's, it could be five crew members or six yep. crew members. Right. But every single time that you're signed that exceptional release, it's not just you saying, hey, my aircraft's good. It's saying that I'm, I'm putting my name on the line saying, I did everything I could to make sure that this aircraft goes up and comes back and that pilot comes back to his family community. And again, that piece is not really said a whole lot. And again, people just do the well, job. But at the end goes, of the day, it's that person that's getting in that aircraft. It goes back to what I said earlier about putting your people first, right? We talk about putting maintainers yeah. first, but you're also putting those pilots first, yep. right? You, that Absolutely. should be your very first forefront is anything we do as a maintainer. Hey, are we, is this thing going to be safe? Or am I just trying to get it greened up? Am I trying to fix it or am I trying to green it up? Right. Absolutely. Two big, very different things. And Good point. anyone you sign those forms and, and even, you know, the pilots that walk around and, and doing their, their walk arounds, right? Anytime you put your name down, you got to be thinking about all the other people, not just yourself or that mission at that time. And I'll right. tell you what, there are times when a pilot is out at the jet and he'll ask, Hey, is it fixed or is it good? And, and very rarely do you find a time where the maintainer says, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> but very often the maintainer might be thinking, no, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be good. I don't know if it's been fixed, but they don't want to tell the pilot that. And I think that if you had a pilot come out and be like, Hey, this jet had a vibe. You think the vibe's thick? Like, ah, fuck. I don't know. I think the pilot would be like, <laughs> um, maybe I should go back to the ops desk and step, up, step into the spare. But the problem is we don't, we don't want to expose to ops our failure and, and, and you know as well as I do, some A1C tells a, a major getting in the jet, yeah, it's fucking vibes every time. We haven't been able to figure it out. We're just kind of, you know, that, <laughs> it's going to go back to the chief, and, the, and, then, and then the A1C shit's going to get pushed in. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it perpetuates an unhealthy sort of relationship. It's a, it's a miracle if ops and an AMU do have a healthy relationship because there's so many influences to, to wedge in between those two. And that's why it's, you know – that's, that's specifically why I asked Bear. I mean, I asked about 17 other DOs they couldn't make it, and then Bear said he could. No. <laughs> hey, I'm, hey, top 18, I'm good with that. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> no, but I asked, you know, I asked Bear specifically because I remember there was a, there was a couple of Fridays where I said, it's not going to make it. It's just, I think it was, I think it was that one uh, D model that had the UHF problem. You remember back in the very beginning? I, yeah, I don't know exactly what up. About. He's like, do you want me to – Code three it. I'm like, we're gonna work it no matter what. That doesn't help anything. I just need oh, you not to expect it on Monday because it's not gonna yeah. fucking happen. We're gonna dig into it. But that was the trust, right? He's like, okay, I know Chris wouldn't lie to me. He's gonna work it. I don't need to red exit or code three it or anything. But like, that's a you. I, I feel like that's a unique sort of relationship that isn't in most units where ops and the AMUs are a collaborative effort to help both the pilots and the maintainers to get the the because i mean the reality is maintainers don't want to not fly they want to get sorties done they just want to get it in a way that doesn't destroy them and ops wants to not destroy people to get the sorties done but it requires a certain amount of communication and trust between the two sides to get it done so so yeah. bear i got a i got a question for you bear yeah so we we know what it takes and listen to to move up into these positions such as super and lead super and um you know amu uh superintendent uh, moving up to be a DO, um, you know, you kind of see, from what I've gathered from you, 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 you know, you'd like to tell it how it is, right? You, you mentioned something about Fester at the beginning, telling them like you're just being honest. Um, are, are those kind of guys typically put in those DO positions? Man, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. As you can imagine, it's complicated. Like, right. You know, the guys that do the best, I mean, are, it is still a hoop jumping, you know, box checking kind of thing. Right. And that's why I really felt very lucky to be, you know, a DO was because I didn't check some of those boxes and I still got to, I still got to do it. Mm. And so I think there are times when being a DO is a meritocracy. And I think there are times when it's just like, you know, next guy up or he's got the boxes filled. Um, and it's, I'm going to step into philosophy a little bit, but I think that we've lost, a lot of ability to lead. Yep. We right. don't know how to do it anymore. We stop mentoring leadership. We 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 do a good job of of teaching hoop jumping. We do a good job of hey, accomplish this, 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 and this. Hey, you'll probably be a commander. Like if you just do all those things. Right. Well, is the guy does he have to possess the ability to be a commander or to be a DO or to be a XYZ? You know, the greatest 
IP in the world isn't necessarily going to be a good DO. Yep. And vice versa for that matter. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, I can't tell you how many times a, a squadron commander stood in front of a room and said, my number one job is to take care of you, which I think is total bullshit. Like it right. that cannot be his number one job because the mission of the air force is to fly, fight, win. Mm. And if his number one job is to take care of me, then he's probably not going to send me out to go fly, fight, win because that's not taking care of me. Right. And so what you end up doing is you end up putting the individual in front of the mission. That's very dangerous, right? Because I'm not saying that we can't take care of the individual, but this is a service or, I mean, we, we are a service to our military. We are, our job as we have said on the dotted line for whatever our enlistment was, you know, 10 years for me as a pilot, going through pilot training, you know, five year enlistment, whatever it is, you said, I will serve. And so as a consequence, you have put yourself subordinate to the mission. As soon as, as soon as we start putting people in front of the mission then we get just a weird, uh, I don't know, like wrong priorities, right? Like, dude, I don't fucking want to work 12 hours. Like, yeah. right. I don't want to do it. I'll tell you what too, what happens is the, the, the commander says, my number one job is to take care of you. And then what happens is he really puts the mission first because yeah, that's fucking true. reality. And then everybody yeah. in the audience is like, what the fuck? I thought he said he was going to put me first. So now he is just, murdered all fucking credibility and that's why you have to say look we have a job to do i'm gonna do my best to give you the resources to take care of you i care about you but we still have this piece to do if it's not possible then we'll do what we can and explain why we couldn't do all the other but i'm that's not going right to destroy there. you to get it done but we are we put on the uniform to do this not to fucking do barbecues Oh, and that's it, right? So it's long-term mission accomplishment. Mm. Like, I can't crush everybody on, you know, one particular week or weekend or whatever um, and not get long-term mission accomplished. To Chris's right. point, which has got a fantastic picture there. You have to be able to sustain, you know, um, I mean, long-term sustainment. Anyone can can push on for like you know twelve hours and you know a week a, a week at a time, a month at a time. But it it's the long it's a long game. It's a marathon. It's not it's not a quick sprint. Um, and well, figuring was, how to do that, you know. Yeah. Well, I looked at so in 1997 when we came up with the core values, um, like I, I thought they were the goofiest thing you could ever hear. Like I was like, you know, as a cadet at the academy, and I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> Like, I was like, I cannot believe that this is what we came up with, right? And then, like, imagine my surprise 17 years later when I'm like, oh, okay, this is actually pretty smart. <laughs> in, in 13 words, we say exactly what we want to say. Service before self, excellence in all we do. Like, it's, it's perfectly done. And the one that I like, the, like, service before self, if you look at the original writing, it's S, like big S, like the service. Not little S, like I serve. Right. Dude, we put our service before ourselves. Like we, we put the mission above the individual. And then like Chris is saying, if I'm honest with a dude from the beginning, then when I ask him to do something uncomfortable, then they, there's a trust there. Like, yep. hey, dude, I need you to charge that machine gun nest. I, sorry, bro. Like, yeah. I need, I need your help. I need, dude, the, the crux of our getting to, you know, on an AOS movement depends on working this weekend. I need your help. Okay. And, and the so, other piece is you don't bring them in to mop the hangers on weekends because that shit and, doesn't actually <laughs> fucking matter, right? What are you talking about? You, 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 you make that sacrifice ask for the shit that fucking matters. You don't do it all the fucking time because then when you go to do the big ask they're already fucking done but, you don't have them deal. anymore i think people don't quite understand the service before self when they're when they're living out against their airmen right i mean you can if you use that for every oh you know yep. we're, we need to support the mission it's service before self i mean there's a real fine line between treating people as humans or you know like I said, human resource is your number one resource you have anywhere you work, right? Yep. If you don't treat it right and you don't balance it out, you're not going to get, you know, you're not, you know, you're not going to get the juice, right? Out of the squeeze, right? So I, I don't know, just uh, 
the service before self, I mean, it, it is definitely what we all, we all want to accomplish the mission. We all want to fly stories. We all want to make, you know, train pilots or, or whatever we're doing in the Air Force or any job. But the service before self, if it gets used every single time, it gets every for single thing, everything. I agree. it doesn't mean shit anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and what, you know, we have to have the foresight to say, okay, we're not going to fly a 12 front this week so that next month when it's yep. really important that we can. Right. Yep. Long-term planning, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, that's right. It's to say, okay, you know, we got this phase coming up or we got this thing. So we're going we're gonna to take a knee in order to, for long-term mission accomplishment. And I don't know, I mean, I, I don't think everybody can, can either has the planning to do that or the, yeah. just even the foresight to be able to do it. Right. Sometimes it takes courage, right? Just to take yeah. I remember when Eric, remember that time, I think it was with Bear, where you were like, hey, do we need to fly these? Because I guys could really use like maybe it's just a six turn four or something. And whoever the ops guy was, was like, yeah, we could do that. And I literally went to you like, how the yeah. fuck did you do that? Did you just, Dude, I, like, I just ask. Like, I'll oh, tell you shit, one time, you could do that? <laughs> one time that stuck out in my, my mind, um, we we're talking about collaborating with ops. Um, it was about, you know, loading full belts or half belts or, you know, yeah. I, we came to a conclusion between us and ops that, Hey, we're going to run, you know, the pilot will burst off 250 rounds. That'll be enough to get what they need done. And the lead super and ops had agreed upon it. Yeah. And I remember a certain chief came in and lost his mind and yep. made us revert back to the full belt, but we were hurting for weapons guys. Right. And yep. we were trying to stretch as much out as we could. So ops can be effective. Right. And then, you know, we could save some time for maintenance. And that was one of the key points in my career right, when I realized, um, you know, it's not always about, it should be about collaboration, but yeah. you know, some people aren't about that. So, hey, listen, guys, I got to drop off. So, it's, okay, it's a pleasure. It's been awesome. It's good seeing you. Nice uh, seeing you, and, and yeah, you too. I'll see you around. Yep. See you. Okay. See you guys later. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Well, I'm really not sure what else I wanted to talk about. Bill, do you have anything else? I know you have a list. No, it's not a list. I just it's not, I, it's I not a shot. I'm just saying. Joggers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the one thing, the one thing for me that, that uh, again, when, when we we talk about all these these difficult pain points where you know we're trying to get our point across as far as what we can and what we can't do, and and what I've found over time, uh, again, even on that the last position, um, you know, sitting as an inspector general superintendent trying to manage everything was. When I had to talk to general, I started just painting the picture. So I figured I wouldn't bother him for a couple of days and I'd paint the picture of what I wanted to tell him. So that not only was it coming out of my mouth, I could actually give a visual representation of here's my problem. And I think that's, that's one of the pieces hard because again, even for people in leadership positions, if people are just, if they constantly hear the, you know, we can't make it, it's on the backs of the guys, whatever. If you can't show the picture, I mean, it loses its credibility over time. It's kind of like just talking about the service before self. Same scenario, but it's again, you can complain, 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 but if I can show, if I can paint that picture and give a visual representation of it, well, they can take it and they can either absorb it or they can dismiss it. But at least you've done everything you can. And when it comes down to a, an incident of some sort and you've done everything you can, that, and that's like, the, that's like your, yeah. last, your last lifeline, if you will, you did everything you could do. And, and, and the, the reason I bring that up is people's ability to sleep at night. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, I, I know that you are probably very similar to me. You probably went home and then when you laid your head on your pillow, you're like, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I forget about that? Did I communicate this? And that's the way my last seven years of the service was. That's, that's exactly what I thought all the time. Yeah. Since 2011, no, so last nine years, that's the way I slept. Um, and again, just because it's the buy-in and I prefer to take care of my folks versus, you know, uh, you know, put it on my back. But the one thing that I kept on trying to do, which helped me out to a point was painting the picture. And, and again, until we can, you know, people learn through what visual, tactile, audible, if we can tackle all those different things. And right now uh, in the picture of people sitting in, in command positions or at the Pentagon, the reality of it is, is how do we paint that picture? How can we show, what type of visual representation can we give to go, uh, we're barely making it. Mm. It doesn't you know, work through leading lagging indicators. The metrics don't matter anymore. So I don't know if you guys me, remember. 
but in uh, when sequestration was being kicked around, because you remember it wasn't like a quick pass. There was like it was like six or nine months where they were threatening to do it, and basically Congress couldn't get their shit together, and basically it was the dead man switch that got thrown. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, staff like they all wrote, they all signed a letter to Congress saying, "You will create a hollow force if you cut funding ten percent and still re- still ask us to accomplish the same mission." There is no way it can be done, and it's like those are the smartest fucking people of all the services that know their service better than anybody else. That's why they're in that position. Their job is to advise the legislative and executive branch on the health of the service and what to do and what can be done. And they literally said, if you under-resource them, you're going to fuck everything up. And it turns (laughs) out they were right. Like, who would have fucking thunk it that the guys that know what the fuck they're talking about were right? And it's so, like, you're saying, like, we need to be able to communicate it. We have did. And, and the problem is we communicated to an executive and we communicated to a legislative. And until their constituents care, then they're not going to care. That's the fucking unfortunate reality of the way, you know, yeah. the government works. The, you know, veterans aren't voting. I mean, they are, but they're a fucking tiny little drop in the constituent bucket. So until there's noise, until there's articles in the New York Times or in these other publications detailing the, the – that's why – why do you think there was such a massive, you know, response to the suicide epidemic going on in the Air Force? Because it had, you know, media traction that was, attent- that was attracting the attention of Congress. Then all the people that were, you know, that knew it was going on but nobody was asking them why it was going on, all of a sudden they got really spun up because it's – people started fucking asking questions. So – you know, I guess the answer is, is, you know, you know, the whatever few amount of people are watching this video, if you've made it an hour and 40 minutes into our uh, old man <laughs> conversation, you know, just realize that your voice to your legislator is how you can affect change in the Air Force. Because the reality is without that, it's not going to fucking happen. Am I am I old man retire retiree kind of? <laughs> well, you know, my, my dad always my dad's got to, uh, you know, I won't take his credit, but, you know, he always says training has no constituent, you know, F-22s have constituents, uh, F-16s have constituents, you know, they're built in, uh, yeah. not anymore, but you know what I mean? F-35 right. is built in four parts. So they have a constituent training dollars have no constituent. Right. And so yeah. like probably the most important thing that we do, which is train, not just get our folks trained, but also can keep them up to date in whatever there is no constituent. And so it's a damn hard task to get them the resources needed to train them properly. There is no constituent, but yet we can buy 650 F-35s, right? Because yeah. it, it looks really, really good. on a train, Yeah, a trained force is an intangible. You don't know it until you don't fucking have it. And then when you don't have it, it's way too fucking late to get it figured out, <laughs> which is we're close. I think we're close, honestly. Like, I think if we were, if we, if, you know, and I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I think if there was a, a legitimate near peer adversary, I think, I think people would quickly realize what seven plus years of under resourcing the military has done for us. And I think that is, you know, really, really sad. Well, it's a scary thing for like, you know, you know, for, I think about this all the time, like, you know, the threat briefings used to be like, nah. Right. We got that. <laughs> so now the threat briefings are like, ooh. So uh, how do you, how we can take care of that, guys? You got any right. ideas? You know, like, yeah. cause that, that's gonna suck for for all of us, right? Yeah. That's not gonna be Absolutely. fun. And, and so I don't know. And Bill, I want to touch on something you said because I think it's really good. Is you know how do I show? How do I tell? How do I explain to the guys above me? So. You got to think about the guys that are there. First of all, a a fighter pilot commander is very ill-equipped, and I hate to say that, to to understand what goes on in the maintenance. Well, I'll say in all, they don't understand what's going on. Yeah, I hate to say fair. it like that, but like, you know, I didn't understand about you know CDC. I didn't understand about all that stuff until I got to be a commander. And, and only because I had 150 enlisted maintainers that I had to like, oh, what, wait, so what's this CDC thing? You know, right. what, is, what does it take to get a guy qualified? <laughs> How many training items they have? 
to become a, a three level? Are you kidding me? Like, Those are all what? pencil whip, by the way, Barry. You know that, right? I know, I know. <laughs> hey, just yeah. put that out there. The, the training NCO was in my office every single day. You know, like, hey, sir. I'm like, you better have good news, man. Like, yeah, but anyway, <laughs> so like, and so sometimes they just don't, they don't, they don't know, they don't understand. And the other thing is, is that we're all arrogant assholes. We all mm -hmm. believe that we're the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. And especially as a 05, 06, like you're like, dude, I got this, I got this dick. I got this figured out. Mm -hmm. And so we're the smartest guy in the room. And to convince that person that A, they don't, maybe not understand the full picture and to change their mind on X topic, it's a tough, tough challenge. Yep. And how do we do it? Like, and I like paint the picture, you know, it's a very special thing to be able to do. Um, uh, they had Luke actually had a uh, they had a blessing there. We one of the pilots there. Um, I'm trying to remember which squadron is it. He went to the three tenth though. Uh, AMU is major, and uh, oh, he yes. did. I cannot remember his name, but he yeah he broke he his was, neck and he was an AMU yeah. uh, OIC for a while. Oh, he did, he got a very great. good perspective. They loved him because not only you know he was hard on his own folks you know the maintainers that he was now in charge of but at the same time he knew that the pilots that he had worked with it was going to be a hard uphill battle for them too if they're trying yep. to get some you know some stuff that probably wasn't so correct and he was constantly engaged and it was yep. an amazing thing and i remember talking to him over the smoke pit and he was saying i had no idea mm -hmm. he goes i tell you what now that i see all this stuff he goes, everybody should get, everybody should have a small stint to understand exactly what you all do. He goes, I had no idea. Now sitting in here, understanding everything. That's why I want to protect my folks. Yep. It's like, okay. But again, it's, it's, we talked earlier before you got on about immersions and we do it in between the maintenance back shop and the flight line pro super, because again, the maintenance back shop has to, has to care about every single aircraft for every single squadron. Whereas a production super only has to think about his squadron. Yep. So, again, in this sense, again, for any type of uh, commander for a flying squadron, you would think at some point in time, if they got that exposure, two weeks, a month, whatever, so just a, a peg of training in there someplace, they could see exactly how that happens, how it starts from the planning to the takeoff to, you know, receiving the aircraft back, getting a prefer flight again. Um, again, it's, it's that whole thing, you know, it's, it's hard to sit here and tell somebody exactly – how good or bad they're doing unless you actually walk them out on their shoes. Um, yeah. And I talk to my guys all the time uh, in the company I work for now because, again, my military experience is more of a detriment to me because I see what the, the, some of the expectations for them are not reasonable mm -hmm. and they don't see how many ways they're being pulled because it's just, seriously, it's just like maintainers, but they deal with software. Yeah. And I got the grunts. I got the production section. And these guys are the central point of anything that comes in that company. Any type of software has to touch my guy's hands before it touches anybody else, which means every single problem has to go to them. Mm -hmm. I have five people. Kind of hard when we have 60,000 customers, just saying. Yeah. So, but know, again, when I tr try trying to paint that, I tell my, I tell my boss, you don't, you don't know what they go through. And it's easy for you to say, yeah, we're going to do this new product or do that. Do that. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, for me, when I take a step back, I'm like, whew. Uh, hey, guys, talk to me. I need to know when you need to take a knee. They're like, what? I'm like, if you get too much stuff on your plate, you get too many calls left, right, whatever the case might be, talk to me. I need to know before you're failing, before you want to jump, jump out, let me know. We'll take the knee. We'll take the hit. I'll take responsibility of it. But again, it's, it's, hard for, it's hard for me to accept that we have something like seven different departments that we interact with, and I've been trying to get an immersion so they understand it. The amount of emails these guys got. There's different channels and team, Microsoft Teams they had. So, they have so many different outlets of communication, and they're tr they're staying above water. They're all they're all stars. All of them are. Um, but again, how long can we sustain that? Eh, I don't know. So we all joined before there were AMUs, right? I mean, we all yes. joined under the fighter squadron sort of model. So what Bear was saying about he got a window into the enlisted maintainer piece when he did his squadron command. Which, you know, in, in the late 90s, every fighter squadron commander had a, an enlisted shirt that had to deal with all the maintainers and, and all those yeah. issues that kind of went along with it. And, and the squadron commander probably had to tell the wing commander when the maintenance side piece wasn't quite making it. Like he was responsible to answer that piece, which I would like to think probably 
made him a more informed 05 at the squadron level, 06 at the group level, and 07 at the wing and above level. But are we at the point now where our four-star generals have now gotten to the point where they might have been squadron commanders under just the ops AMU piece? Like, literally, they've stovepiped only in ops all the way up without any consideration for the logistical heavy lifting by the AMU. And, you know, Bear is certainly not one of them, which is why I invited him here. But there's some real officers, and especially in, in my experience with fighter pilots, that see the maintainers almost as a servant class. Like, maybe they shouldn't have been maintainers if they don't like being shit on by, you know. You know, it's like <laughs> Yzma from, uh, uh, like, you know, we should have thought about that before you came peasants, right? Um, but, um, you know, I, I wonder if the reason why there seems to be this disconnect into the force capability is because we've insulated our senior leaders from the enlisted piece besides what's filtered to them by unit leadership 100 percent. i think it works quite well hmm. well i think oh go ahead bear no you're right you, you hit it right right in the head like we've insulated it and it's just i don't know it it was such a good experience for me to understand what it takes to get a an a1c number one trained and then you know this dude's becoming like, you know, kind of an adult, kind of. Mm -hmm. And like all those things that go into that, you know, the personal <laughs> stuff, the, am I going to get married? Am, or, or, nah. am I going to have a bad relationship? You know, it, it, how are things going to go? Like, am I going to make a bad decision? Probably, you know. And then, I don't know, man. I, I just, I wish that I'd seen it earlier. I, I'll say that. Like, to truly understand, you know, that life, the, 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 I don't know. I can, you go ahead. I can tell you the camaraderie, uh, cause that was with 81st fighter squadron out at Spangalum, uh, mm -hmm. 2001 through 2004 underneath Colonel Malkowski. And the reason I remember him, I can remember probably about 50% of the pilots I worked with was yep. the camaraderie was bigger. We understood one another. We deployed together, went TDY together. We were a family. Yep. And when they, uh, it was probably beginning of 2004, they adjusted and they turned them to the 52nd Aircraft Maintenance Squadron. They, they went their separate ways. And it really drove, you know, a huge dagger between us. And it was, it was an us and them. Where before, you know, your TDY and your, you know, go out in the town, it was everybody was together. We were, again, it was family. Um, and then, like I said, ever since then, it's, it's never been the same. That was, that was probably my best experience in my career was those first three years of Spengallum. And I said, and then it was said, not that I didn't have great experiences. Let's just say the atmosphere changed. Uh, and it, again, it was just a harder relationship. Yeah. So probably the majority of the people that are going to be watching this video are going to be maintainers. So Bear, is there anything you want to tell a maintainer that maybe they didn't know about the ops piece or something that you wish that they knew? Well, first thing I want to say is uh, the, the very first thing that I was ever told about walking out to my airplane was that, you know, when I saluted and shook my crew chief's hand, we were exchanging something very important, which was, dude, this jet is ready to go. And I say, dude, I trust you that this jet is ready to go. My walk around is cursory. It is something that I was told I have to do, but I trust you. And I can tell you that for me, that like that felt very important. Like I'm like, all right, man, I trust you. And luckily of the, you know, 3000 flights I've had in the air force, I've had 3000 landings, you know? And so like it's that, that trust that I had in every piece and every touch that was on that airplane is to me sacred. Like the fact that a guy says, sir, it's ready to go. I say, I trust you. Thank you. Let's go, let's go do this, you know? And, um, and then to hear you guys, it's not just tonight, but like, you know, I've heard different conversations where I'm like, man, like the fact that, you know, Bill, that you think about the things that you have done, you know, to make sure that everything is done and it's on, and I, I get it. It's on my behalf. It's to make sure that, that airplane goes up and down safely. Like it sure. means a lot to me. And I, I, I just can't tell you guys how much I appreciate that. Like 
my wife, my two boys, they, yep. they appreciate that. It's a solemn bond. I mean, it's a vow that we have, you know, that here you go. And, and uh, like, so thank you. Like, I cannot say that enough. Like I said, 3000 takeoffs, 3000 landings. And Thanks for your trust. Uh, I've been around the world flying this airplane and I don't know. I, I yeah. I've crossed all the oceans. I've done all the things. And <laughs> so again, thank you. And I don't know. I, uh, I think the biggest thing that we can learn is um, we are not different. We share the same goals. And if we can find that, that uh, alignment through trust, then, you know, I don't say we're going to solve all the world's problems, but at least we're going to be able to, uh, have reasoned discussions about what is possible and what is not. And then from there, you know, I, I, I don't know. I pray that we can trickle that knowledge up potentially, uh, build a group that understands service before self understands and can mentor leadership. Yeah. Uh, and then, and now we're getting somewhere and I, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. So I'll always hope that it will get better. Um, that's, Okay. That's it. That's awesome. Well, uh, I can't thank you guys enough for carving, you know, hour and a half, two hours out of your Sunday night to sit down and talk about this stuff. Um, um, but thank you very much. And hopefully we'll be doing a few more discussions. And I'll probably be reaching out to you guys again. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Bear. Bill, it's good to see you, service. Bear.